Sorry. Back to school. Uh, <coughs> just kidding. Uh, I don't know if when I woke up this morning uh, all day today, I have thought about how many knows this is the week of the Passion. Yes. And uh, I know we've got a Roman Catholic viewpoint of this week. Let me just say what I mean by that. Uh, we are going to celebrate Friday, what they call Good Friday. I don't know what it was good about, good about it. Uh, it certainly wasn't uh, good in some people's eyes. If you if you study the entirety of the Bible, you we picked Friday, the Roman Catholic Church did, to celebrate what they call Good Friday, the death of the Lord. In, action, in actuality, there was no way he could have died on Friday. I'm going to get two amens. But let me just put it in simple math. I don't know how you can die on Friday, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth and raise two days later. I don't know. But uh, anyway, so I, for years I have studied on the death, burial, the resurrection of the Lord, the timeline of it. And so what I want to do tonight, since this is the day that Jesus died, he died on the Wednesday. All right, and uh, I thought it would be fitting. Right now, uh, I was thinking all day today as the clock went by. Nine o'clock this morning, he's crucified. Twelve o'clock, the earth or the sun refuses to shine. Three o'clock, they take him off the cross. They've got to entomb him before six because six starts Passover feast, and they had to have him in the tomb before Passover. Nobody could hang on a cross on Passover weekend. All right? That Passover weekend started tonight at 6 o'clock. But I want to just take for a, just a few minutes. I told Terry we're going to be here 10 minutes. We're going to be here a little bit longer now. I want to walk through tonight, just for your sake, the, not only the week of crucifixion. Because how many knows that every day this week he did something extraordinary special? Almost 2,000 years ago. Now listen, it has not been 2,000 years yet. It will be 2,033. 2,033 by the time it is 2,000 years. How many knows he died in 33 AD? Right? He was born 0 AD. He lived 33 and a third years upon this earth before he was crucified. And the Bible breaks it down. If you study the Bible, the Bible gives you what he did before he was ever baptized with John's baptism. It starts his ministry at 30 years of age. It tells of the year of inauguration, the first year he's preaching the gospel. And he is instituting his kingdom and his gospel. Then it goes to the year of popularity. How I many knows his second year of ministry, everybody's praising him. They all think he's great. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. Things are happening around him. He's feeding the multitude, and he is popular. But just like any good preacher, those years of popularity soon fade. And then he went into his last year, what the Bible would call his year of opposition. And then it goes into his final three months of his life. Then the last days of his crucifixion. And if you'll allow me, I want to walk through some of those pages tonight in the Bible. And then I want to deal with tonight just what he done for us this week. Is that all right? Anybody want to know that? I'm going to tell you something. If I, if I can recognize, you know, if you hear a story in the Bible, uh, I'll give you for instance, the story of the woman with the issue of blood. It's a powerful story to me. But the reality of it was that I never understood the fullness of that until I studied what gave her that transmittable disease that she had and how she passed that disease on. I don't know if anybody, any of y'all has ever heard this. How many knows that woman had an issue of blood for 12 years and in the same chapter there is a girl that has an issue for 12 years named Chalice's his daughter. When you figure out that she has visited Jairus' house, that woman with the issue of blood, by Levitical law, had to, had to visit Jairus' house to be pronounced unclean. And that disease is transferred. That little girl, being in the womb of her mother, the disease is transferred. If you read Jos Josiah's writings, 
It is transferred to that child in her mother's womb. When that child is 12 years old, she starts a menstrual cycle that she never stops bleeding. She breaks out in fever, and just so happened when Jesus is coming through the city of the woman of Samaria, or the woman that has an issue of blood, she reaches out and touches the garment. He is on his way to Jairus' house to heal Jairus' 12-year-old daughter of the same disease. Amen. Now that's powerful. It makes that story come to life even more than what it is. Jesus' is years of inauguration, his time from Nazareth to Bethabara. From Bethabara into the wilderness of Judea, he's driven. And into that wilderness, how many knows in that wilderness, he is tempted of the devil. With three great temptations, and let me say this, every one of those temptations was not a temptation of power, really. It was a temptation of love. The wilderness temptation, he's driven there. He looks at Israel, they are starving to death. And Satan says to him, if you be the Christ, why don't you turn these stones into bread and feed your people before they starve? That is the real translation of that scripture. And Jesus could have turned every stone in that wilderness to bread and Israel would have got fat on the bread thereof and lived prosperously. But Jesus understood it was a temptation of love and that's why he turned around and said, men shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Had he, had he fallen in that temptation and simply turned the stones to bread, the bread of life that come down from heaven would have never been displayed upon the table of the Lord. So he's driven in the wilderness from Nazareth to Bethbara, from Bethbara to the wilderness. And then he goes uh, from Canaan to Capernaum, from Capernaum to Jerusalem, and the Judean tour of Jacob's well at Sachar, which is where he visits the woman at the well, and he delivers Samaria in that first ministry uh, tour that he has there. And then you come to the years of Jesus' year of popularity. He's about 31 years of age. He goes from Nazareth to, to Capernaum. He preaches the gospel there. He tours Galilee. He returns to Capernaum. From Capernaum, he goes to Jerusalem for the Passover. And then he goes from Jerusalem back to Capernaum. And it seems like his ministry is back and forth because he is trying to get Capernaum, which is his home state or his own home place of ministry, the very place that the Lord wants to work his ministry from. How many knows every now and then you can go to the religious world and preach and then you got to come back to where you have headquartered your ministry from and then you turn and go to the world to preach the gospel only to turn back around and come back to the headquarters of ministry to straighten them out. What I mean by that is there's times I'll leave this church and go preach revivals and I'll preach to, to ungodly worldly sinners and I'll touch them with the gospel only return on Sunday to the headquarters of this ministry to have to preach to us again and get us back in line and help us to get to the next spot of ministry. That's his year of popularity. He's healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's visiting the city of Nain. He's going to, uh, to places where he's casting out devils. And then the Bible says he enters what the Bible calls the year of opposition. Now I'm laying a foundation with all this because I'm going to get to the most important part here in a minute. He comes into the year of opposition. He comes into the place of religious authority. And he is going to face the times now dealing with church folk. He's going to deal with Pharisees, Sadducees. He's going to deal with scribes. He's going to deal with keepers of the law. And they are, And he is pushing their doctrine. I mean, that was their doctrine that, that they wasn't allowed to eat on the seventh day. They couldn't plug corn on the seventh day. Jesus turns his disciples, them being hungry, and passes right through a man's cornfield and allows them to put corn on the seventh day. They come to the Lord. They tell the Lord, it is unlawful for your disciples to pick corn on the seventh day. Jesus turns the gospel, the law of the gospel back around to them and said, have you not heard how David and his mighty men came through the temple in a time of war and eat the shoe bread, which was on the table of the Lord, which was only meant for an offering to God. What he was trying to get that religious crowd to understand that there is no greater law than the law of love. 
And David had such a law for his men of war that fought in his kingdom that he would rather them eat the shoe bread off the table of the Lord and not perish as to watch them hunger. Let me give you something. Did you know that the book of Proverbs said that if a man steal to feed his children for us to not condemn him? Now, thief, a thievery is wrong. It breaks the law. How many will agree with me if you steal, you're breaking the law of God? But how many knows that the Lord looks at that and says, if a man steal and defeat his children and has no other way, the law of love always outlaws that. If you want me to prove that to you, the law said that you that have committed adultery, fornication, lying, stealing, cheating, all the stuff you've done, deserve to die. The soul that sinned shall surely die. But did you know that the word of the Lord showed mercy and love? And no greater law is given to man but law. I got five of you saying amen. Jesus passes through his year of opposition. He's going to the religious crowd and he is in trouble. They are not liking what he's preaching. They're, he's coming against to condemn and everything. Does not the law say an eye for an eye, uh, an eye, for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? They asked Jesus and he said, but I said that you love your neighbor. Pray for them that is thoughtful to use you. Do good unto them that do evil unto you. If your brother asks for your shirt, give him your coat also. And if he asks you to walk a mile, walk too. He is going against the religious uh, thought pattern. And when he does that, he comes in opposition to them. Here is what got Jesus crucified. Leave God's plan out of it. Leave the Father's plan out of it. Simply he was crucified because he came against the religious sect that day. He was one of their own. They felt like he was betraying them by not living according to their law. Get, get this. He enters their Jewish synagogue in this year of opposition. He walks up while they are having service. He gets a hold of the book of Isaiah. A minister hands it to him and he walks over and says, Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for, for he has anointed me to preach the gospel and to heal, blind, heal the sick and open blinded eyes and to preach uh, liberty to those that are held captive and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He gives that doctrine and, and they're fine with that because that's out of the law. But they did not know that he was there to fulfill that law and then he said these words if he'd have just read the scripture he'd have been fine but he said these words this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears and he walked over across the rope sat down in the chair that only the Messiah was supposed to sit in and when he sat down they started ridiculing him and wanted to cast him out and throw him off of a cliff because he just now has went against everything He has made himself the Son of God. Are y'all hearing me tonight? It's amazing to me. Jesus' footsteps in his last months, he's now 33 years of age and he's got three months from the time he turns 33 to end up on a cross. He goes from Bethbara to Bethany. There at Bethany, he raised his Lazarus from the dead. From Bethany to Ephraim. He turns from Ephraim and, and, and towards Perea. He turns from Perea and goes back to Bethany. And when he returns back to Bethany, he heals a woman that has an infirmity of 18 years. He blesses little children. Blind Bartimaeus is set by the wayside begging when Jesus returns to Bethany and he heals blind Bartimaeus and Jesus is, is anointed in the house of Bethany or the house of Lazarus by Mary for his death. Not for his miracles, not for his crusades, not for his ministry tour. He is now at the point he is going to die. 
Now, can I go on with you a little bit and tell you about his last days? And then we're going to tear his week down. The last days of Jesus, he goes from Bethany to Jerusalem. And according to the Bible, how many knows on Sunday of that Passion Week, he rides a donkey into Jerusalem? Are y'all ready for this? He is on the Mount of Olives. And he tells two of his disciples, he, if you remember in Luke 19, he stands and looks over the city of Jerusalem and says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered you as a hen would gather her brood? But you would not. And the Bible said he weeps over that city and he says to that city, Your dead bodies lay in the street with your children within you because you missed the day of the visitation of the Lord. When he pronounces that judgment upon them, he turns, now that's his own people, that's his own chosen people. He turns and looks at two of his disciples and says, go down to a street where two crossroads meet, and in that cross you will find a donkey tied with a young colt behind it. Loose that donkey and bring him to the Mount of Olives. The King of Kings is going to ride into Jerusalem on his triumphant entry. Here's the problem. Jews are looking for Jesus to come on a white stallion. I wish I had some help in here. But he's done mess with their doctrine. They look for him to be a king that ascended from heaven and took a throne in Jerusalem and ruled Rome from that throne. He's done mess with that. He didn't come that way. He came as a baby in a manger. He's messed with everything they've ever thought about the Messiah. They bring him the donkey. He on the donkey and the Bible said a young coat is following behind him. I wish I had time tonight. I'd preach real strong that that old donkey represented the Old Testament because a donkey is a is an animal of, is a beast of burden and that's what the law was. But there is a young coat following that's tied to that old donkey wherein the Bible said has never a man set on him nor a burden been put on him. Can I just share with you that our Lord and your master rolled the Testament in, but he brought in the New Testament and it was tied to the old because the old was a schoolmaster to the new. I wish I had some help in that. No man had ever looked in the New Testament because it was sealed with seven. Oh, help me, don't get me in Revelation. That book was sealed with seven seals, and the Bible said the angels desired to look into that book and could not. Are y'all ready for this? Sunday, he brings his triumphant entry. They tear off palm branches. Everybody say palm branches. Off the palm trees. Jay Wong preached to us there and not so good about that. They broke off palm branches. Here's why they did it. They threw it down in the way. They took their clothes off. Some of them threw palm branches down. Some of them threw their clothes off. The others waved their palm branches and sung high hosanna to the king. And the reason they threw their clothes down was though, so that the feet of that donkey would not even be heard in the land. Oh, help me now. In the Old Testament, the clogging of feet was a judgment that was coming. Do you understand? That the oh my God, I can take off running right now. Do you understand that Jews had been under Roman rule, and every time they heard hoofbeats come down the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem, it meant that Rome was coming in, and there was going to be babies die, and women die, and men die. It simply meant to those Jews that judgment was coming down that street. But when Jesus got on the back of that donkey. Enters 
that city on Sunday and they're all praising him. They're throwing their clothes down. They're high hopes having the king. They're having revival until Monday morning when he gets to the temple. He walks in the house that is called the house of prayer and they have tables set up. And they are exchanging money for people that have come from far lands. And when they exchange the money, they are taking some of that money out. And they're adding an interest rate to it to exchange. And they're selling blind doves and spotted up lambs. And they're selling stuff that the Lord won't even accept in a sacrifice. But the priests are making money. And they have turned the house of prayer into a den of thieves. And the same Lord that they praised on Sunday finds his way out. On Sunday, right out of the temple. And then they turn their back on him. Isn't it amazing that we can shout and have revival and have a good time while the Lord is blessing us? But you let the Lord pull out a whip and start correcting us, and some of us fall out of love with him. Oh, help me now. Monday. He spends all day cleansing the temple and turning over tables and running the thieves out of the house of God, out of the house of prayer. On Tuesday, he enters what the Bible says is the Last Supper. It is the Last Supper he will eat on this side of eternity. It is the Last Supper he'll ever, get, ever gather his disciples around and according to the word of the Lord, he gathers them because he has got to see which one is going to betray him. In order to put the plan of God in effect, there has to be a Judas somewhere. There's got to be a betrayer. There's got to be somebody that sells him out for 30 pieces of silver to fulfill Zechariah's prophecy of his selling out as a slave. And so on Tuesday, he has the last supper with them. And according to the word of God, he looks around and says, one of you will betray me this night into the hands of sinners. And all of them say, Lord, who is it? Is it I? Is it I? And it seems like that Judas, according to Bible history, is sitting on the right hand of Jesus. And John is sitting near Jesus also. And the, according to the Bible, and if you read the Greek manuscripts, John the Beloved, the younger, the one that writes Revelation, leans over and places his head on Jesus' breast and said, Lord, tell me which one of them it is. And Jesus whispers back, it is he that dips with me the second time. The second time. Let me tell you why Jesus said the second time. Why not dip the sop the first time and it be them? Because when they came out of Egypt, when they had the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, the Exodus Supper, they would dip the first time for mercy. They would take hyssop and dip it in blood, wine, mingle with gall. They would dip that and it meant mercy. The second time meant judgment. And when they came out of Egypt, Moses and the generation of God dipped the first time in the Red Sea mercy and stood on the other side. But when Pharaoh dipped the second time, it meant judgment. Jesus said, he that dips with me the second time. Jesus dipped the first time. And when he dipped the first time, Judas wretch and got to stop himself and dip with Jesus the second time. It meant judgment. Listen to this. Not only for Judas, it meant it for because when he dipped the second time, God poured his judgment on his son. Amen. Judas went out and hung himself on a tree and Jesus was hung on Calvary's cross. Amen. Straight across from the Kidron Valley, Judas hangs on one tree and can look across the Kidron Valley. Jesus is hanging on another tree on the Mount of Blessing. And Judas is hanging on the Mount of Cursing that Moses cursed back in the day. And Jesus is looking across. And if he turns to his left, he can see Judas hanging on the tree. Suicidal. If he turns to his right, he can look into the temple where the veil of God is that he's going to rent before it's over. The Last Supper. He gets up from the Last Supper. I've got five minutes and I'm done. Listen to this. And he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he prays until his sweat becomes great drops of blood. 
they come out to arrest him and bring 600 soldiers to arrest one man. Jesus said, who do you seek? Now he's prayed until he's weak. He's prayed till his blood, his sweat has become great drops of blood. He's prayed till there's nothing left, no energy, no, no, no power in him except the power that God would give him. Who do you come out looking for? And they answered the question, Jesus of Nazareth, and he said, I am he. When he said, I am, they fell as dead men. Because it was the same utterance that God gave Moses from a burning bush. You tell them, I am sent you. When he said, I am, it was the same utterance. And they all fell as dead men. Couldn't you see the Lord just walking over there and trying to pick them up? Get out. You come out against me with swords and staffs. I can, and, and, and I was daily with you in the temple. I healed your sick. I raised you dead. You didn't raise up swords or staffs against me. Now you come to arrest me. A trial of, mo a, a, a mockery. Listen to this. From Tuesday night till Wednesday morning, he is laying. Let me just show you this for a minute. You are going to be amazed. He is laying to Caiaphas' house from Gethsemane. It is a prison house. He's kept in stocks, in prison, and in bonds in prison for part of that night. He leaves Caiaphas' house and he's taken to Pilate. He leaves Pilate and when Pilate says, I find no fault in him, send him to Herod. And he sends him to Herod because Herod was king, the Jewish king. Pilate was a Roman king. Send him to Herod and let him crucify him. Herod gets to him and says, I'm not touching him. Send him back to Pilate. Pilate, he comes back to Pilate, they mock him again and Pilate says, take him to do whatever you want to I'm innocent. This is where Pilate washes his hands. And then they lead him to Calvary outside the gate of Jerusalem. And they give him not only a mockery trial, they give him a mockery in crucifixion. They take the high priest and all the religious crowd and they're walking before him and they're mocking him and they're saying all kinds of things against him. That happened this morning at 9 o'clock. I love what happened at 12. Jesus hangs on the cross. Listen to this. His first cry. And it was the third hour they crucified him. Which was 9 o'clock this morning. Jesus' first cry from the cross. Father forgive them for they know not what they. Everybody finish that. One of the malefactors. Soldiers parted his garments, casting lots upon them. And one of the malefactors which was crucified with him, a thief, said, If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Save us and save yourself. The chief priests are saying it. Those that pass by are saying it. The soldiers say it, are saying, If you be the king of the Jews, save yourself. One of the malefactors rails on the Lord, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and save us. But the other answering said, We've received our just reward. This man's done nothing. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The second cry from the cross when Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And then for some reason, his attention is turned to the bottom of the cross where stands his mother and John the beloved, John the younger. And he says, Woman, behold thy son. Then he says to John, Son, behold thy mother. And he lays the responsibility upon John at that point. She is now your mother. You are, are, are her son. And according to the Bible, John took her from the cross scene right then. And to his house. And that was the last disciple. All the others have scattered. The only one that went to the cross with him was John. And now he's taking his own mother and going home. And according to the Bible, he takes care of her till the day of his death. And then all of a sudden, something happens at the sixth hour at noonday. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. The sun refused to shine. God turned the world black. Jesus starts crying. From now a spiritual inward man. All the other cries from, has been an outward expression of his humanistic person. 
But now he's crying from within, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Then he cries, I thirst. And according to that scripture, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, according to Old Testament scripture, God literally turned his back. Had he looked upon him, he would have lived. I wish I had some help. Do you realize that when Adam was driven out of the garden, it was not to keep Adam out of the garden. It was to keep Adam from eating the tree of life and living forever in a fallen state. But when Jesus got him to the garden, the gate of the garden, he turned his back on Adam and walked back into the garden. Hello? And when Jesus... The last Adam, not the second Adam, the last Adam. Because they, if there's a second, they can be a third and a fourth and a fifth, but he's the last Adam. And so now he is in the similitude of, of, of the earthly Adam, and he's going through the judgment of God, and God walks him to the garden and turns his back on him. He dies on that cross. Listen to this. The fifth saying is, I thirst. The water of life is now saying, I thirst. He cries out in John 19, 30, it is finished. And then the last cry from the cross is, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And he gives up the ghost. And he dies right at the ninth hour of the day, which is three o'clock today. He dies. From the third hour to the ninth hour, he hangs on the cross. They take him off the cross at, at, at 3 o'clock. Let me tell you one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. There is a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea, which the Bible says is a wealthy man from the east. And here's what he does. According to the Bible, him and Nicodemus get together and go to Pilate and Herod and beg the body of Jesus. One of the gospels says he craved it. Craved the body of Jesus. Y'all ready for this? They take the body down and lay him in a tomb, and we're going to celebrate that resurrection Sunday because it's Easter. It's the day he comes out, the first day of the week, and thank God for that. But listen to me, you don't have to wait till Sunday to start praising the Lord. Let me tell you what the Bible says. Now, listen, it is what time is it? Anybody got a watch on? Tell me what time it is. It is 10 to 8. Guess what the, the Lord is doing right now on this day? Did you know that the Bible said, Be it not strange, or think it not strange, that he that ascended into heaven first descended into the lower parts of the earth, led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. Let me just share this with you. From the Old Testament, every soul that ever sacrificed to God, that ever believed in the promise of the Father, and according to Hebrews, looked to that promise when they died, they did not go to heaven. David said, when I die, I shall not ascend into heaven. But he did go to a holding place called Abraham's bosom, which Jesus referred to as paradise, and that's why he said to the thief on the cross today thou shalt be with me in paradise because when Jesus died he was going to make a trip to Abraham's bosom and according to Luke 16 uh, help me now is where Lazarus was when he was looking across that great gulf and the rich, uh, the rich man that was in hell could see Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham it is in that place that Jesus goes and they are held captive because of the letter of the law. The letter of sin, the law of sin and death captivates them. Satan had them bound under that law. But when Jesus died and gave up the ghost and said it's finished, he was talking that Old Testament law is finished. The curse of that law is finished. The bondage of that law is finished. And I into the lower parts of the earth and preach 
her falling off. And all of that, now David, listen to this, David, which said, when I die, I will not ascend to heaven. He understood that when he died, he was going to a home place, a paradise garden. Do you hear what I'm telling you? He is now looking across that gulf, and the Lord is coming across that great gulf because he's went to hell, and he's been the sacrifice, burned with fire. But yet, can I tell you, he's not only the sacrifice, he was the high priest. And if the high priest laid the sacrifice down, the high priest has the power to raise the sacrifice back up again. It is the high priest that puts the sacrifice on the altar, and it's the high priest that raises the sacrifice back up off the altar. Do you imagine Noah and Abraham and Solomon and all of them looking across that gulf? We've trusted in that promise. We've looked for it. And all of a sudden, they've seen others come across that. They've seen Isaiah come across it. Isaiah is saying, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. His name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. That's going to be a little bit longer, boys, but I prophesy. All of those. Can you imagine David coming across that gulf with, his, with a heart saying, I've been singing about him. I wrote songs about him, but I'm not here. I'm not him. Hear me. John the Baptist is beheaded. I, I, I'm going to let you go. John the Baptist is beheaded, and he crosses that gulf. And he's just asked the question, do we look for him? Is he really the one, or do we look for another? Tell John, the blinds receive with their sight, the poor is getting the gospel preached to them, the dead is being raised. Oh, the gospel has come to them and they cut John's head off and here he goes across that gulf and says, I am not him, but there is one who comes after me whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. He'll baptize you. He's preaching that message. Listen, I saw him. I was on the banks of Jordan. I was baptizing in water under repentance when all of a sudden across that sea or across that river came a man down that seashore Here comes a long bearded, long white haired man. 
ain't never seen you in this city. Who are you? Well, they call me Moses. <laughs> what? Yeah, I raised from the dead when Jesus got up, I got up. <laughs> now I've often wondered, can, I, can, I, can y'all just let me ponder for a minute? How did all of them get to heaven? Because they're still not here. Well, if he raised them from the dead at the same time he raised, he raised from the dead, Jesus got on a cloud and went back to heaven. And said there's clouds around him. And according to Hebrews 12, the clouds he's talking about that we're encamped about is the witnesses of the Old Testament. So when the Lord ascended back to heaven, wouldn't it be right that if he raised all the dead of the Old Testament that believed in him from the graves, that he took them up with him when he ascended to the Father. Amen. I wish I had time. I'm going to preach him Sunday. I'm going to bring him out of that grave so strong. He's going to make every demon in this church run. Amen. My demon will be jumping out of people. I could go a whole lot deeper into that garden experience. They touched the tree of life. And Adam was not allowed to touch. And that tree of life was Christ. And we live, they live forever. They'll never die, the Bible said again. And God shall wipe away what? All tears from their eyes. Let me share something with you. I'm still weeping. But they're not. I wish I had some help. So if you want to be thankful today, don't be thankful because you're driving a new car. Got money in the bank. None of that stuff. Why don't you be thankful that right now Jesus is preaching to the captives. Right now, he's dealt off our payment of sin. He's been burnt. He becomes sin for us. And he's become the sacrifice for that sin. But the fire doesn't consume him. And hell can't stop him. And come Sunday morning, the grave ain't going to contain him. Hallelujah. He's good. I just wanted to put you in the thought this week of what he's done for you. I got up this morning and I thought at 12 noon today I was thinking, the sun's not shining right now. <laughs> He's given those cries from the cross. He's rejected the vinegar filled with painkillers. He wants the full effect that a sacrifice would feel at the block of sacrifice. <clears throat> we have a great God, you know what? Amen. And what's so crazy about it is I can guarantee you that if you'd have been the only one, he would have still went through all of that. I think we ought to give him the greatest squall, shout, scream, whatever you want to do, praise off the right now. Sunday night when Brother Stanley was singing Ain't No Grave Gonna Hold My Body Down, I looked over Brother, Brother Frank and I said, everything you've ever preached about 50-something years of ministry is going to come to pass and into fulfillment in a moment in a twinkle of an eye. That's it. Think about when that trumpet of God sounds. Everything we've ever done for God <laughs> automatically going to pay off. I'm looking forward to it. Now, I can just imagine what they felt like in paradise, seeing him by himself come across that cuff. But guess what he's going to do when he comes again? He's bringing all the souls of the saints. He's going to empty heaven. According to the Bible, 
when he comes to get the church, all the souls of the saints are going to come with him. There's going to be millions and millions of people descend with him to call us up into the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You want to talk about a resurrection? <laughs> He's got enough power not only to raise himself, and not only to raise them out of the Old Testament, He's going to raise every single person, saved or lost, they're going to be resurrected, some to life and some to damnation. But he's got enough power to raise everybody at one time. Hallelujah. I love the Lord, don't you? I want you to shake three people's hands before you leave tonight. Tell them you'll see them Sunday morning. Bring somebody with them. All right, everybody, everybody's going to give an offering tonight. Get your offering out right, right there. Prepare giving the offering God bless you. See everybody Sunday. Hey, donuts and coffee at 9.30 Sunday. Sunday school at 10 o'clock. And then Sunday morning Easter service. We will not be having Sunday night, okay? Sunday morning Easter. Yes, Father.